Um, so this talk is going to be kind of a total wild card. Um, because I haven't talked in like nine months, and this is sort of the assembled thinking of the last year or so of sort of sabbatical and wandering. So it'll either be like really interesting or totally incoherent. We'll see. Um, so I'm going to start with a question. And there is actually a correct answer to this question. What is the most important invention in the history of the world? Shout out a few things. Wheel, fire, Wheel, fire. electricity. electricity. The internet, telephone. Okay, so how do we actually answer this question? So this is a graph. Um, the bottom is time. I haven't put the years on quite yet. So this is social development index. This is a combination of infant mortality, life expectancy, basically fulfilling Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, turns out that this almost exactly charts with the population of the world. So this is the black line is a graph of the population of the world. Um, and we can see here, there's a clear inflection point where things are basically flat for all of history, and then it turns. So what invention led to that turn? Cheese. No. <laughs> Close. Um, the steam engine. Everything in the world basically sucked until the steam engine. And specifically, or more broadly, I should say, the Industrial Revolution. The world reached a billion people in about 1805. We're now at 7 billion plus, right? Think about that growth rate of population. So what happened? Well, before the Industrial Revolution, life was shitty for basically everybody. So there's this idea called the Malthusian Trap. So Thomas Malthus, British economist, he predicted that people's income would not go up because whenever there was a technological development, like, for example, they got better at producing wheat, the population would grow and basically eat up all of it. So in Bab I thought these numbers are fascinating. In Babylonia in 1800 BC, a day's wage of a laborer would buy you 15 pounds of wheat. In England in 1800 AD, 3,600 years later, 13 pounds of wheat. So your wage for a day bought you exactly the same amount of wheat for basically all of history. Everybody was poor, nobody owned their land, Every, any surplus was grabbed away by some rich landowner. And most, I think almost most importantly to the psyche before the industrial era, things did not get better over time. Your children and your children's children and your children's children and your children's children was going to, life was going to suck equally as much as it sucked for you and as it sucked for your ancestors. And I say this because it, it's kind of obvious, but so built into our psyche is that things are going to keep getting better and better and better. And what changed was industrialization and we got out of that Malthusian trap for the first time in the history of the world. If you lived, when my great-great-grandfather, who I'm named after Joseph Goldman, was born in 1861, he had eight children. When he was born, the expectation was that a third of them would die before the age of five. Luckily, he was born right as the Industrial Revolution was taking off, and seven of his eight children lived to adulthood. But that was the first time. So I think of the world as basically having four historical eras. There's hunter-gatherer, which is from the beginning of Homo sapiens till about 8,000 BC. That's before history. We were all puttering around. Not a whole lot happened. Then the agricultural revolution we moved into cities, and that was the beginning of history. And I think of that entire area as basically preparation for the industrial era. So science happened, science progressed, but most people's lives did not actually get better. But what happened is all of this science accumulated, and then eventually we got to the industrial revolution and more and more people started to move into abundance, meaning they moved into a life that wasn't just about staying alive. And so I think we are making the transition right now into the fourth era of human history, which is the era of abundance. The era where most of us in this room probably, hopefully, are not worried about where their next meal is gonna come from, not worried about sleeping on the street, not worried about basic human necessity. And more and more of the world is moving into that, and then the question becomes, okay, now what? For the first time, you can think of the entire arc of the history of our species as moving towards this one moment when everybody suddenly escapes from the need to stay alive. So I think there are three key challenges. Again, I told you this would be a really broad talk, so follow me. Um, I'm kind of going to blaze through the first two, and then I'm going to spend a lot of time on the third, which I think is sort of as entrepreneurs, maybe things to think about. 
First question, how do we get everyone to abundance as fast as possible? I think there are, there are like plenty of others. These are the ones that I happen to be thinking about, so they're like semi-random. Um, how do we solve energy? So if you think about the Industrial Revolution as escaping human muscle, big human muscle, and maybe animal muscle, at some point, and maybe the natural end point of the Industrial Era, is when energy becomes basically free. And there are all of these things that we actually know how to do, but we think of as constraints that energy solves. So I'm originally from Los Angeles. We have a big problem with water. There's a huge drought right now. I had to stop, I had to stop watering my lawn. It was extremely painful. It looks terrible. Um, and we, but we know how to desalinate water. Most of Israel's water comes out of the ocean as desalinated. What's the problem with desalination? It's very energy intensive. We know how to fly a plane at 10,000 miles an hour. You could fly from Los Angeles to Munich in an hour instead of 11 hours. But it takes a ton of energy. It's really expensive, so mostly we don't do it, except for, like, dr drones. Um, thing B, I think, that's getting us to abundance quickly, dumb robots. What I mean by dumb robots is robots that are very good at doing one thing, self-driving cars, farming robots, haircut robots. More and more this will happen. More and more, basically, the cost of everything goes to zero. And then the third really important thing is the developing world catching up, is more and more of the world catching up to everything we've done. You look at China, hundreds of millions of people coming out of poverty, having enough to eat, um, super important thing to work on. I think Bill Gates' letter from last year at the end of his foundation, uh, from his foundation is one of the best things on this, but I'm not really gonna go into it very much more. Second thing, how do we do? How do we avoid killing our entire species in the process of getting to abundance? Some things we might, that might kill us all, super intelligence or AI. This kind of sounds silly, but the more I talk to people who seriously think about this, the more they're really, really freaked out that when we create true artificial intelligence, its first natural reaction is like, wait, there's all these creatures that are sucking up all the resources. Why do we want them around? Second thing, climate change seems obvious, sadly, to like most of the American government, it's not obvious. And then war. We might just actually kill each other, and we have the weapons to do it. Hopefully that won't happen, but we should probably be pretty worried about it. Okay, thing three, and this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. This is sort of, um, how do we live happy lives in a world of abundance? So as entrepreneurs, what should we be working on to design a world that works in abundance? Okay, first thing, we are going to see a world that, unless we do something about it, is going to have a ton of wealth, a ton of value being created, with most people not having a job, and massive inequality. That sounds kind of crazy, right? Um, the world's been getting more equal. It's important to say that because the developing world's catching up. But the developed world, which is what more and more of the world will look like, has been getting more unequal. Some people say that's globalization. That's probably part of it. Some say it's public policy. But if you look at Europe and the US, which have very different public policy on this, pre-tax, you still see massive inequality. So what do I think is causing this? Mostly technology. Why is technology causing this? And I would point people to a great book, The Second Machine Age, um, Andrew McAfee and Eric Bernholson, who have become friends of mine. So one thing is that middle class jobs are the ones getting automated. Things that are complicated and repetitive are easier, are things that get automated. So a bank teller, ATMs, accountant, tax software, drivers, soon to be self-driving cars. I can't overemphasize the self-driving car thing. In the US, there are 10 million-ish people, maybe like 8% of the workforce, that drives things around for a living. Buses, trucks, cars. All of those jobs are going to go away in like the next 15 years. And we have literally no plan on what the heck we're going to do about it. We are now seeing way fewer higher paid people. So I think it's a great comparison that they do in the second machine age. Eastman Kodak was like the big company of the first camera era. And it's heighted at 145,000 employees, mostly middle class jobs. George Eastman was worth maybe 10% of the less wealthy Facebook founders. Eastman Kodak went out of business almost exactly the same time as Facebook bought Instagram for a billion dollars with 16 employees. Facebook now applies about 6,000 employees. Facebook is still mostly a photo site, like most of Facebook's traffic is actually still photos. But just think about those two companies. You have massive wealth created by a much smaller number of people compared to a much larger company um, that's worth less but with way, way more employees. I think another big part of this is the randomness of that success. Uh, and what I mean by that is I think it's interesting when you look at the smaller start, the, uh, sorry, the big consumer startups, most of them are started by first-time founders. Why? 
because you have no idea really which consumer thing is going to work. But it costs so little to try that so many shots on goal are happening. And then um, finally in this world, I think you see where capital is higher return than labor. The Tomas Piketty book was sort of all the rage. I think it was interesting. It was a 600-page book by a French economist that like every, but everybody was pretending to read. I don't think anybody actually read it, but it's another story. I actually did read it. Um, it took a long time. But the basic idea that when capital returns more than labor, and if you have a world that's highly automated, highly mechanized, it's mostly about capital. Like, are you, can you invest in machines? Can you invest in robots? Capital tends to accumulate. So I think this graph, which is from Andrew McAfee, really kind of sums it up. He calls it the great decoupling. For the first part of the, of the 20th century, as labor productivity and employment went up, income went up with it. But you see kind of at the end there, it starts to decouple. And so we're at maximum productivity, at mean income is high, but number employment has leveled off and median income has leveled off. This is in the US, but this is generally true in the developed world. That keeps happening. That's a huge, huge change. I think it's really worth emphasizing where more and more wealth is created with fewer and fewer people working on it. How do you respond to that? We should do a better job with education, but it's probably not enough. I interestingly hear more and more people around the tech world talking about universal basic income, which sort of sounds like a commie idea, but the idea that like, we're just gonna give everybody a check every, you know, every month, and that will be more than enough for them to like, buy what they need to have. Then people will then earn money beyond that. And then a question I'm just going to ask without answering it is, when the robots make other robots, when you have a factory that's completely run by robots that make other robots, who owns the factory? What does that even mean? So I think one of the big questions is a cultural question. And I thought I'd, it's important to put a German philosopher in here, since we are in Munich. Um, one of the most influential things I read when I was in school was Max Weber. Anybody here read Max Weber? Just curious, Germans? Shockingly few of you, okay. Um, the basic idea was there was a massive cultural change that happened in order for the Industrial Revolution to happen, which was that people needed to think that working really hard was an important part of their identity. One of the big problems at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution is you would pay people more money an hour, and they would just work less hours, because they're like, oh, I have as much money as I need. Why would I work more hours? That's insane. And so, without going deeply into it, this sort of Calvinist theology of you work really hard, you go to heaven, doesn't really matter why, but we built this culture that my sense of self-worth is inextricably wrapped up in my career. How many people kind of feel that way? That your career is a pretty core part of your self-worth? I sort of think it's probably a lot more than you, but okay. Um, and now, as I've traveled around, other parts where like, you go to like, Southeast Asia, people think this is literally the craziest thing they've ever seen. Like, wait, you have a ton of money, you have like everything you might ever need, and you're not actually just spending more time with your family and staying at home. And again, I'm coming from an American perspective. We're way worse about this than Germans are, in my experience. Um, but so the question is, how do you have a culture, what is the right culture in a world of abundance? Right? If people, if most people don't actually need to work in order for the society to move forward, if the society has also kind of reached this abundance plateau, then what is the right culture to have? How do you have people feel like they can do what they love, not only what's most important? And um, how do you get people to be, ha be happy with what is instead of yearning for what isn't? I think there's this real trade-off made where this sort of Protestant work ethic makes people really, really productive because they're constantly feeling like they need more but it also makes them deeply unhappy. And that trade-off maybe has been worth it because it's gotten us to this point where not everybody is like starving all the time, which is really, really good. So I would just point out, maybe the Buddhists are right, worth looking into. Um, and then third, sort of a bizarre prediction, but I think religion's gonna come back with like a really big bang, but in somewhat different form. Now, all of my friends who are sort of secular humanist -y types, and I'm sure a lot of you Europeans out there, um, think this is crazy and probably a bad thing. But I would argue that maybe you think that because when you think of religion, you think religion that's used to control people. And you think of a certain conception of God. A conception of God 
that is what they call dualistic. God is a guy with a beard up on a mountain who has like powers and does magical things that are completely uncredible and contravene science. But I would suggest, and again, you probably didn't expect this talk to go into like the God direction, but here we are, um, that people ask the wrong question about God. They ask the question, do you believe in God? And if you ask that question, the answer is usually, no, I'm not a lunatic. But if you instead ask the question, have you experienced God? And you think of the question of God not as a person up there, but as a human experience, just like love is a human experience. If I said, do you believe in love? You'd be like, well, that's a stupid question. Love is a word that we put on an experience. Instead, I ask, have you experienced God? That, that, that experience of oneness with humanity, of transcendence, that is the Eastern conception of God. And actually, a lot of some pieces of Western religion also have this, uh, this kind of non-dualistic and I, th I think we are starting to see little trends that are happening. So, have you guys been to Burning Man? And you have to have a Burning Man reference from the San Francisco person. Um, there are 70,000 people, and there's a couple hundred thousand that want to go, but they don't have enough tickets, who go out to the desert for a week in the middle of nowhere. And it looks a whole lot like a religious pilgrimage festival of hundreds or thousands of years ago. And people are trying to experience a new kind of collective consciousness. And they might not call it a religion, but it's a religion. And then the other thing that religion does that I think is becoming, going to become really, really important is the constraint of desire. So one thing I've started doing in my life, which is kind of weird, and I don't, I haven't always, I don't always do it, but when I'm sort of in one place, is keeping the Sabbath. So I'm Jewish. This is an old Jewish idea that for 25 hours a day, you totally stop, you totally disconnect. That might seem crazy, but I think in a world where we're always connected on our phones, where we're constantly getting pulled in a zillion directions, that set of very strict constraints becomes very valuable. I don't know if anyone, do you guys know Aziz Ansari? He's a comedian. Anybody know Aziz Ansari? So he just wrote a book, which is amazing, called Modern Romance. And he partnered up with uh, someone who does research on this. And there's this great moment at the beginning where he's interviewing couples. And he starts with old couples. And he's like, how did you meet Geraldine? Well, Geraldine and I grew up Three blocks away, I met her, she was cute, we got married, we lived happily ever after. And he argues that because we have so much choice, so many options, that we're unable to settle. And that, uh, that lack of constraint actually makes our lives a lot more difficult. There's this other weird Silicon Valley trend, this place called Camp Grounded, where a bunch of adults go to a week-long summer camp where they surrender their phones and just try, try, try to disconnect. I think you're going to see more and more and more of community-imposed constraints of various kinds because people realize that they've become addicted to choice and to technology. And so the question then, uh, and this is my, uh, my last slide, I think, um, is how do you design technology in this way? There's a good friend of mine, you should check out his talks, uh, named Tristan Harris, who's at Google, does these talks called Time Well Spent. And he makes a very compelling argument. How many of you guys feel just a little bit addicted to your phone? All right, there, we've got the biggest hand raise, good. Having designed a bunch of this stuff, I mean, when I did Causes, we were the most, we went to a million users in the first five days. This had never happened before and has rarely happened since. We got really, really good at viral design. And uh, Ben Parr spoke, and I, I love Ben, but he's teaching you how to hurt people. And that's sort of serious and sort of joking. Th I remember the thing that allowed Facebook newsfeed to happen was when the scroll wheel, you guys remember when the scroll wheel got added to the mouse? Some of you are probably too young to remember this. That allowed you to keep refreshing your newsfeed over and over and over again. Literally a phone and a slot machine, like a gambling slot machine, are designed in the same way. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of evidence that you see lower levels of empathy and lower levels of human connection. I'm 32 years old. I am not native to a smartphone. How many of you guys remember having an away message on Instant Messenger? All right. I, my psychology and yours is probably, if you're 30 or over, is that there's an idea of being connected to the internet and the idea of not being connected to the internet. If you grew up with a smartphone, there is no concept of being disconnected. You, your, the number of times you've, uh, I love like observing teenagers and not in a weird way, but in a, in a, <laughs> in a social science, oh, that got the biggest laugh. Um, <laughs> is you'll see this like holding the phone and talking to other people constantly at the same time in a completely uh, undivided way.
And this may just be like an old curmudgeonly guy at 32. Um, but I think this is a really, really big problem. And there's a lot of evidence that this is making people less happy and less connected and more distracted. And I would really, for those of you that build products, think about, we have built this, um, what Tristan likes to call an attention economy, where you make money by distracting people. If you're Facebook, if you're Google, if you're anything that's ad-supported, you make money by pulling people's attention. And so what does the phone do? I mean, Tristan has this great slide of when you get an email from Facebook that says, you have been tagged in a photo. You literally have to respond to that. You are wired deep in your brain to want to respond to that. And what actually happens is you then go in and you spend like the next 30 minutes puttering around the internet. You have no idea why. I think that we are not designed for asynchronous communication. Talking on the phone, talking to somebody, we are designed for that. Asynchronous communication, you send a text message out, and you have this little feeling in the back of your head, fuck, why have they not responded to me yet? Do they not like me? And there's just like a little bit of the RAM in your brain that's being used waiting for that response to happen. And then it comes and you get this little rush. There is, there is very documented that when you get a like on Facebook, when you get that social affirmation, you get a little serotonin firing in your brain. And that feeling, ooh, somebody likes me. That's great. I like that feeling. Um, but this is, like, not healthy. And I think as, mo and as more and more of the world moves into the place where we are lucky to be, this world of abundance, if we don't have constraints and if we don't design technology in a way that does that, it's going to be really bad for people's lives. And then the final technology to point to is virtual reality. Virtual reality scares the hell out of me. Is anybody else scared about virtual reality? Who's excited about virtual reality? Also excited. All right, more people are excited. You should be really scared and excited. I've tried out the newest Oculus. It is great. Why would I ever leave the house? You know what really scares me? VR porn scares the crap out of me. <laughs> Seriously, it's going to be amazing, but it scares the crap out of me. There is a lot of research that, like, the watching of pornography depresses people's ability to experience happiness because they're getting, fi they're getting it fired so many times. It makes sex worse for people. In Japan, which in many ways, I used to live in Japan, Japan is often kind of a harbinger of the future because they sort of live in the future in a bunch of ways. I don't know exactly, but something like 35% of Japanese people um, under the age of 30 have never had sex and are sort of becoming this very, like, desocialized generation. And that's, like, pretty concerning. Um, what's, do I have a next slide? Nope, I don't have a next slide. Okay, great. Um, so what I would leave to you guys is we are about to enter this unprecedented time in history where technology is, gonna, is going to enable more and more, and hopefully, I think in our lifetimes, everybody on Earth, the ability to have far more resources because things will get so, so cheap. When, when we solve energy, food basically gets free, water basically gets free, transportation gets free. And then this question is like, what are we all going to do with our time? And how do, we leave, how do we lead meaningful lives without that historic constraint of trying not to die? And I think the challenge for our generation, really, is to figure out what does life on Earth look like, assuming that we don't go extinct, um, in that world. And so I, I invite you, as you think about what you're going to design and what you're going to build, to think about that. Or you can just go meditate under a tree. That might also make you happy. Thank you. That's for you, man. Oh. Great thoughts. I'm official. They also gave you this when you, when you entered your dorm at Harvard, so that's the two times in my life that I'm getting a stein. Then give it back. No. <laughs> this one's much nicer. Thanks, my friend.